Hello friends, um, here we begin the next lecture, lecture number seven, lecture number eight of uh, advanced thermodynamics. If you recall in the end of the last lecture, actually we were discussing about uh, dissipation phenomenon. So, let us move to the PowerPoint slide which uh, was actually talking about that. So, here we said that um, the frictional dissipation when it is uh, happening between two objects, there is a friction when two objects move with respect to each other, then we normally have to consider the interface as an additional entity and the friction uh, is taken to do work on the interface first. This is the way in which we can do the analysis correctly without which the analysis would actually lead to erroneous interpretations. So, in order to understand that, let us move to the whiteboard and uh, find out. Okay. So, we started with this uh, diagram in the uh, previous uh, class. So, let me uh, do that refresh. Okay. So, we have an inclined plane and there is a block that is sliding over the inclined plane which is here. Okay. So, let us call this block as object 1 and the inclined plane as object 2. Now, this is sliding down let us say its initial velocity is v 1 and let us say it moves to the final position okay, where its velocity is v 2. Okay. Mm or rather we will call it as v1 i and v1 f. So, v1 i which is the initial velocity and v1 f which is the final velocity. Okay. And let us say the center of gravity of this object has moved down by a height let us say h and if the mass of object 1 is m 1 then the change in potential energy between state 1 and state 2 is m 1 g into h the magnitude of the change. Okay. The final potential energy is lower than the initial potential energy. So, the delta potential energy would be negative. This plus the change in kinetic energy which will be m 1 times v 2 squared by 2 plus v 1 squared by 2. Now, this is the total energy change from state 1 to state 2. And if we consider a case where this plane is entirely frictionless, then there is no work that is done on object 1 and or object 2 for that matter and there is no heat transfer and therefore, since there is no work and no heat, if I look at the object 1 and write its first law, then it will be delta E is equal to 0 or E f minus E i is 0. So, this will basically, basically equal to 0. So, what does it mean? It basically means that the decrease in potential energy from the state uh, i to state f of the mass has got converted into the okay, should have been v 1 f the whole square minus v 1 i the whole square. So, v 1 f the whole square minus v 1 i the whole square. So, the final velocity square by 2 minus initial velocity square by 2. So, this is the uh, change in uh, kinetic energy what happened to this it should have been a minus either. Okay. All right. So, now um, suppose there is friction. So, in the case of frictionless uh, movement the m g h is entirely converted to uh, kinetic energy. Now, in this case uh, where there is a friction the V 2 f that is attained in the case of uh, with friction will be lower than the V 2 f that was attained in the frictionless case. So, let us call this uh, uh, V 2 f with friction as uh, V 2 f f and the other one let us call it as V 2 f which is the uh, case without case without friction. So, then the difference between this uh, V 2 f squared by 2 and the V 2 uh, uh, so V 1 f squared by 2 and V 1 f f squared by 2 
the difference between the two kinetic energies actually is the amount of energy that is dissipated in uh, overcoming the friction. So how does that happen? We can look at it in uh, multiple parts. So suppose I consider an additional entity object 3 which is the interface. Okay. Then we can consider this whole phenomenon to happen to happen in three parts. One part is when the block slides down the, the plane and the friction opposes it and therefore the block does work against the force of friction, overcoming the force of friction and comes down. So this work is done by the block on the interface. Okay, so this is the first part of the phenomenon. The second part of the phenomenon is what happens at the interface. The interface itself has no mass. It is a mathematical entity which separates the uh, object 1 and object 2. So it has zero mass and therefore it cannot hold any energy. So if work is done on it, it cannot do anything with that work. Basically what it does is to convert that into heat and that is the second part of the phenomenon. The third part of the phenomenon is that this heat would then flow into object 1 or object 2 depending on their conductivity. So if object 1 is more conductive and object 2 is less conductive, then more of this heat would have flown into object 1 because it is a higher conductor of heat or similarly conversely if object 2 is higher conductive and object 1 is lower conductive, much of that heat would have flown into 2 and if they are equally conductive, the heat would have flown equally back into both and therefore if I do not consider this uh, entity separately, but if I consider only object 1 and 2 which is commonly what is done in uh, most treatments, then what happens is the object 1 does work against friction. Now who does this work get done on? If we consider it to be object 2, then the first law for object 2 should say that because work is done on it, its energy should increase. But in the case where 2 is a poor conductor, the energy actually does not increase in uh, object 2. Or let us say if its conductivity, thermal conductivity is 0, then the uh, energy does not increase of uh, object 2. Practically, it is only the energy of 1 that increases again with the form of uh, heat conduction. And therefore, we and actually end up in a situation where the work being done on object 2 or object 1 and that being work or that being heat uh, de depends on whether uh, 1 is conductive or 2 is conductive or both are conductive. That is uh, uh, not a standard or not a tenable explanation. The tenable explanation would only be arrived at if we consider the interface as a separate entity. That is basically what I was trying to explain in the previous lecture by uh, this uh, whole discussion. Okay. So now if we get back to the PowerPoint presentation, so we say that uh, in the case of air resistance between let us say when a ball is thrown, uh, there is uh, friction which is uh, going to happen around the boundary of, of the ball and uh, this friction basically is going to uh, decelerate the ball, the, the, the flow of the air around the ball is going to decelerate the movement of the ball. So how does this happen? This happens because the ball that is uh, being thrown uh, is trying to do work against the frictional force that is acting on its uh, surface and therefore by expending work its kinetic energy decreases and therefore the ball decelerates and eventually either comes to a halt or it is not able to keep going so it uh, falls under the action of uh, gravity and so on. So the frictional resistance again needs to be considered by looking at the interface between the ball and the surrounding air as an entity so that it is done. Similarly friction between solids like in the example that we just considered. Okay. So that uh, uh, brings us to the close of the discussion on first law. Now in uh, the next section or the next discussion we discuss about adiabatic accessibility which leads us to the statement of the second law. So suppose I say there are uh, uh, two states I and F and an object goes from state I to state F when adiabatically work is done on it. Now the question that arises is can F be actually reached from I when the process is adiabatic? This is a very interesting question because uh, when there are no restrictions 
like adiabatic for example if there are no restrictions then any state is accessible from any other state but when there are restrictions that are placed it is not always possible to go from one state to the other that is uh, if f is not possible to reach from i through an adiabatic process then we actually need to reverse the process and say uh, ei minus ef so if uh, uh, f if i is reachable from f uh, but f is not reachable from i then ei uh, ei minus ef which is i is the final state and f is the initial state then is equal to the negative of w on add which is the feasible uh, part of the process let's try to understand the feasibility of uh, process in one direction or the other so how do we know which states are accessible so let's take examples of electric work and compression work in order to figure this out so let's go to the whiteboard and uh, let's go to the whiteboard and try to understand what we are talking about okay so suppose i am looking at an electric system okay so electrical work in an object so suppose i try to plot the phenomenon on uh, e and q e plane where q e is the ch electric charge which is the the, the the independent variable or the uh, generalized coordinate for the electrical interaction and e is the energy content okay so suppose i have an initial state i at which an object is let us say the object may be a battery okay so this battery is at some initial state i that is it has this much of charge and the energy contained in it is this much so that is the initial state now suppose i imp okay, impose two conditions on it one is adiabatic One is adiabatic, and two is uh, constant energy. Okay, so I have imposed two restrictions on uh, this object. So if the process has to be adiabatic, which basically means that I have got a battery and I have completely insulated it, so there is no heat transfer from the battery to the surroundings, or no heat transfer from the surroundings to the battery. So that is adiabatic. Now constant energy basically means that the battery should have the same value of e it cannot increase or decrease e okay so is there a phenomenon or is there a, a possible phenomenon that can happen when both of these are valid from the state i so the answer is yes but when does when is that possible when i keep this battery completely isolated insulated and i short circuit the terminals of the battery then what happens the charge of the battery rapidly decreases okay but then its charge decreases but since the battery is completely insulated the dissipation heats up the battery the battery increases in temperature but then this heat is not able to flow out so it just stays inside so therefore the total energy of the battery which is the electrical energy plus the thermal energy that is contained in the battery is a constant and therefore the e remains constant but the q decreases from in its initial value to some final value or to zero depending on how long you short circuit the battery so you can say that when both of these conditions are imposed then the only direction in which the process can happen is in the direction in which q e decreases and this direction is not possible this is the uh, possible process and this is not the possible okay, the right side is not the possible direction left side is the possible direction so from state i any state to its left on this diagram is accessible when both of these restrictions are imposed and any state to its right is not accessible when both the restrictions are imposed now to make life a little easier let me remove this condition let me say that the energy can be allowed to change okay so then what happens the adiabatic still remains so insulation you have still kept it so what happens so one is of course short circuiting that is still possible 
and uh, okay, this can go and with short circuiting if there is heat transfer uh, which is going out because the battery is getting heated and the heat is getting dissipated then the process can go in this direction okay and if there is heat that is flowing into the object then it can go in this direction but when it is short circuited the energy decreases okay the other part is when the uh, okay when there is no heat transfer then neither of these is uh, feasible okay but now the battery is only adiabatic so the en electrical interaction that can happen is i can connect it to uh, an external voltage which is either lower than the battery voltage or higher than the battery voltage or equal to the battery voltage okay so if i have an external uh, voltage which is lower okay then the battery would discharge and in that case the energy of the battery will decrease along with its charge so the direction in which it will go is this one this is a spontaneously feasible adiabatic process similarly if i uh, keep the insulation intact and if i charge the battery that is if i keep an external voltage which is higher than the battery voltage then the charge of the battery would increase okay and the energy would also increase so you will go somewhere in this direction okay so when the condition of adiabatic uh, is introduced or condition of adiabatic is uh, kept intact and uh, you allow the change in energy then whenever there is increase in energy there is also an increase in charge and whenever there is a decrease in energy there is also a decrease in charge normally then therefore the processes which are in the other directions would not be feasible except of course when there is some amount of short circuiting or some amount of this thing that's happening but uh, i cannot have the energy of the object increasing when the charge is decreasing uh, and similarly the energy of the charge energy of the battery uh, decreasing when the charge is increasing so these two may not happen but these two can happen so these are preferred directions and these are not preferred directions okay so uh, if i uh, look at uh, phenomena that are uh, accessible adiabatically or uh, not accessible adiabatically you have some uh, phenomena that are actually accessible and some phenomena that are not accessible now if the charging process is non dissipative that is if i have an external voltage which is infinitesimally higher than the internal voltage then you will go along a certain line and similarly if the external voltage is infinitesimally lower then you will go along a certain along a certain line okay so there will be one line that will be there which is an a quasi equilibrium charging or quasi equilibrium discharging process okay now if the voltage is finitely higher then the energy would increase but uh, it may not increase uh, only as electrical energy but will also increase as thermal energy so the energy of the battery would go up in this fashion okay depending on the extent to which there is irreversibility the energy would, would go in this direction similarly during discharge the energy would go here again because in discharge also when there is uh, because it is insulated and there is a rapid discharge the battery gets heated but the heat cannot flow out so the energy of the battery does not decrease as much as it did in the quasi equilibrium but it decreases less okay so on this side therefore you can reach points which are um, on the right side on the left side of uh, this line which is a quasi equilibrium line okay through a irreversible process you can reach any state on this quasi equilibrium line through what is called a quasi equilibrium process or what we call as a reversible process but going this side through an adiabatic process will not be feasible so what ends up happening then is on the eq plane or eqe plane this line which goes through the initial stage which is the quasi equilibrium ch discharging charging line divides the state space into adiabatically accessible states and adiabatically inaccessible states 
So, the states which are to the left of this line mostly are adiabatically accessible, but through an irreversible process that is a process which involves dissipation because of finite difference in voltages and so on. And the li this line constitu uh, constitutes all the points which can be reached through a non dissipative process that is process which is uh, quasi equilibrium or reversible if I would say and the right side is all adiabatically inaccessible states. So, that is one example of an electrical system. In the same fashion, if I try to look at a cylinder piston, okay. So, if I have a cylinder piston like this, okay, and initially this is let us say locked, okay, and the piston in the cylinder has an initial pressure P1 and initial volume V1. And I impose the same two conditions adiabatic and constant energy. What are the possible uh, phenomena if I plot E versus V or V1? If I say this is the initial state, then um, adiabatic means this is entirely insulated here as well as here, so no heat transfer can happen. And constant energy basically means there should be no addition of uh, energy or removal of energy to this, which is no heat, no work to this process. Anyway, no heat is already there. So, if I have to have a no work process, then this should be expanding against vacuum. So, if I just remove the pin and allow it to expand against vacuum, then the energy remains constant because there is no work done. The work is the work done is 0 because P external is 0 and therefore, there is no work done. So, the energy remains constant, but the only possible direction is when V 1 increases. There cannot be a way in which you decrease V 1, which is basically doing work on the uh, cylinder piston and still keep the energy constant and uh, in an adiabatic process. So, uh, this is a, a feasible process and this is an infeasible process when both of these conditions are imposed. Now, if I remove this condition like we did in the previous case, that is constant energy condition is removed, so energy is allowed to change, then there is no heat transfer because it is still adiabatic. So, work can be done on or by the object. So, what happens when work is done on the object? The volume would decrease and the energy would increase. So, energy increases, volume decreases is one direction in which it can go or energy in energy decreases and volume increases is another direction in which it can go. And if it is done through quasi equilibrium processes that is an external pressure which is only infinitesimally higher than P 1, then it, uh, uh, in it increases the pressure inside and increases the energy, uh, decreases the volume and increases the energy as well. And if I uh, do it with an, a pressure which is infinitesimally lower on the outside, then the volume increases like this and the pressure decreases. and this then is a quasi equilibrium process path. Okay. And if the process is not quasi equilibrium, but let us say there is a finite difference in pressure between the outside and inside. So, let us say P external is slight is uh, finitely higher than P 1, then uh, it does work and therefore, there is a decrease in volume, but then there is also irreversible dissipation and that increases the uh, temperature of the object here. So, instead of going along this line, it goes somewhere on this side. Okay. Similarly, when there is rapid expansion and uh, that side is vacuum and therefore, there is a dissipation that happens because of rapid expansion, which converts itself into heat and therefore, the line will not be this, but the line will be somewhere here. So, you can actually have depending on the extent of irreversibility, these states which become accessible adiabatically through irreversible process these states remain accessible uh, through adiabatic reversible process and these states remain inaccessible adiabatically. So, the reversible adiabatic line divides the state space into adiabatically accessible and adiabatically inaccessible states. So, with that if I uh, go back to the PowerPoint presentation and uh, try to conclude, then we will find that um, For the electrical work, adiabatically accessible. So, we considered um, 
a constant energy adiabatic process an insulated battery with constant energy we can at best decrease by short circuiting any attempt to increase the charge would also increase the energy and if the energy is allowed to change if we increase the charge then e also increases if we decrease the charge e also decreases and therefore adiabatically accessible states can be done reversibly through along this line and irreversibly into this side and this side would remain inaccessible in the same fashion for compression work we have the same arguments like we did just did so uh, if i consider a constant energy adiabatic process i can at most increase the volume but cannot decrease it by expanding against vacuum any attempt to decrease the volume will also increase the energy and that is not possible in constant energy process if the energy is allowed to change then increase in volume decreases energy and decrease in volume increases energy and uh, then you get uh, reversibly and adiabatic state so you get this line stay which divides the state space into adiabatically accessible and inaccessible states so Kara theory in 1909 stated the second law as in the neighborhood of any initial state there exist states that are not accessible adiabatically this this is the statement of second law according to Kara theory so this is what we deduce from whatever discussions we just had so we'll close here. We'll discuss the implications of this and we'll see how this constitutes the second law in our classical understanding of Kelvin Planck and Clausius statement of second law in the classes to come. Okay. So in this with this, let's uh, close this lecture. Thank you.